Right, I have the dubious honor of being after lunch. But, uh, so we've heard a lot about some of our tools, uh, radiation, surgery, and now chemotherapy. And uh, I'm gonna try to expand a little bit about some additional tools, which is uh, examining tumor DNA to hopefully identify some new therapeutic options. And then uh, Dr. Hecht and Dr. Lenz will sort of uh, add to the toolbox. And, and as you've heard, you know, uh, really, this is a team approach, uh, so I have the pleasure and privilege of working with, you know, all of these people to really, as we all work together, to uh, improve outcomes. And I do want to start by thanking Debbie's Dream and, and Mary Margaret specifically for helping this to go from just an idea that we wanted to do to an actual uh, symposium, so thank you. Uh, these are my disclosures. I uh, born and raised in Boston, so uh, I'm a diehard Patriots fan. Don't hold it against me. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about the who, what, where, when, why, and how, because I think if you can understand these aspects of really any topic, then you have a pretty good understanding. So uh, who gets this disease? Um, how do they get it? Why do they get it? Um, how does DNA play a role in, in all cancers, but specifically stomach cancer? Uh, why should we think about this type of testing? And when? When do you test for this? And what? where's the future going to be? So I know we've Dr. Wu sort of highlighted this already, and these are the World Health Organization figures just showing that there are geographic variations. So darker colors here are higher rates of gastric cancer. And uh, as many of you know, there are higher rates in some Asian uh, countries as well as parts of the Middle East, uh, Southern North America, and South America. And if you look at these numbers, you'll see that about 10 cases per 100,000, that's some of the darker colors. But what I really want to drill home is uh, that this is more than just a global problem. It's also a local problem. So I won't spend much time here, but this is re repeating sort of in another way what Dr. Wu already showed, that there's about a million cases a year of stomach cancer. Uh, and the sad thing here is that there's about almost three quarters of a million deaths per year. So w whenever you see the number of cases close to the number of deaths, you know you're dealing with a highly lethal problem, and that's what we're all working to try to improve. This is information from the California Cancer Registry, and uh, LA County is highlighted by the arrow. And what you can see here is that LA County, uh, partly because of the ethnic demographic, has some of the highest rates of stomach cancer actually in the whole United States. And this is comparable to uh, countries where the rates are um, some of the highest in the world. So between 2010 and 2014, there's almost 5,000 cases uh, in LA County that's reported to the California Cancer Registry. And there are certainly additional cases that uh, don't get counted. So uh, we're hoping to improve the outcomes for all these people, and it's certainly a lot of people. So how do you go from risk factors to cancer? And a lot of these risk factors culminate in damage to the DNA or increasing the risk of damage to the DNA. So I'm not going to dwell a lot on risk factors. Dr. Wu highlighted a lot of these. Uh, but H. pylori is one that we're all asked about frequently. And essentially, it's a bacterial infection. And there are some variations in the bacteria that produces chronic inflammation in the stomach. And the interaction between the bacteria and the immune system and the stomach lining can increase the rates of damage to certain genes and certain components of the DNA. And as these cells get more and more abnormal, they actually undergo a malignant transformation and then can become cancer. And this doesn't happen to everybody, which is why it's a risk factor. And not everyone who has H. pylori will get stomach cancer. There are other risk factors, some you're born with and some you acquire. And that's an um, important concept that we'll touch on. Uh, so I want to I want to back up a little bit and talk about DNA. So. DNA is actually a remarkable machinery. Uh, think about copying your name or saying a tongue twister as fast as you can 10 times. You're, you're going to make an error. And usually you can pick up on that error and you correct yourself. Uh, DNA is a similar concept. So you have to copy DNA to make two cells. And DNA is constantly being assaulted by uh, viral injuries, radiation, smoking, other risk factors. But it has a remarkable capability to make two perfect copies. And if it makes an error, like a whiteboard, it will erase that error, put in the correction, and go on. And so 99.9% .9 of the time, DNA makes this correction perfectly. Nothing bad happens. And actually, there's several steps that have to happen to go from just a DNA error to cancer. So it sort of has to be a perfect storm of things. So 
uh, what I'm showing here is that you have the DNA error, and sometimes that error has no consequence. It doesn't affect the cell's ability to do its function. It doesn't result in increased risk of cancer. But if that DNA error happens in part of the DNA that makes a protein, and specifically if it happens in part of the protein that's important for the protein function, and even on top of that, if that protein function is important for cellular growth or division or invasion, so you have to have a perfect storm of all of these changes, uh, then you can affect the actual function of the cell. So you can turn off a gene that's important to put breaks. You can turn on a gene that's involved in growth, and then you have too much growth. So I have sort of likened this to um, autocorrect on texting. And everybody texts. And uh, most of the time, autocorrect fixes your text, and there's no problems. But if the autocorrect changes the word, uh, if that word is important for the message, then you can change the whole message. And so that, that's sort of how cancer mutations, they can change the whole message of the cell, and it can be wrong. And uh, this is just an unfortunate example between a, a mother and daughter, I think. Yeah, it'll, it'll take a second, but... It'll <laughs> so uh, just to go back between the differences between DNA that you're born with, which is in all of our cells, and DNA that... Uh, changes uh, during the cancerous process. Uh, at the bottom here is just a microscope image of the lining of the stomach. And so all of these cells, although they're different parts of the lining, they all have uh, the same chromosomal content. And so these are the things that you're born with. You may have been born with a mutation in your DNA that you acquired from a parent, or it may have happened in a random process um, during your development. And these are things that you can't change, as Dr. Wu mentioned. And some of them increase risk for some cancer and other cancers. This is actually not what we're talking about. So you, you can't change these things, and, and rarely do they impact um, our therapy choices. What I'm going to be focusing on is uh, what we call somatic DNA. This is somatic DNA changes. These are ones that are really only found in the tumor cells themselves. So these can be things that turn on genes make them overactive, turn them off, make them not active when they're supposed to be. These things also change over time. So if you're diagnosed and then your cancer comes back, if you examine the DNA at time one and then again at the time two, there's going to be some differences. And we'll talk a little bit about how we're thinking about using that. So Dr. Chow hinted at this. Um, chemotherapy is, still has a very important place in stomach cancer and has led to a lot of advancements. but uh, as Dr. Chow mentioned, chemotherapy um, acts broadly on dividing cells, and, and some of the selectivity is based on rates of cell division. But that's also explained some of the side effects. Targeted therapies, if you understand the biology of a patient's specific tumor, you may be able to narrow down the therapy. And, and our targeted therapies, they're, they're not perfect uh, by any stretch. They certainly have a fair number of side effects in and of themselves. Uh, but generally, when you compare targeted therapies to chemotherapy, there are fewer side effects, hopefully with improved outcomes. You just have to find the right people. So this is sort of the traditional way that stomach cancer has been um, diagnosed and broadly characterized. Um, as Dr. Wu mentioned, you know, patients present with nonspecific symptoms, uh, weight loss, abdominal pain. Uh, someone does an endoscopy, they look at the tumor, they find a tumor somewhere in the stomach, they get a biopsy. Pathologists help us to look at the biopsy under the microscope. And it's broadly can be divided into basically two types of stomach cancer. Something called intestinal type that looks like it makes more glands. And something called diffuse type, which sort of spreads in the walls of the stomach. And pathologists helped us a lot. Uh, but we're actually looking to add information on top of this. So newer ways. Basically, same process, get the same biopsy. You still get told if it's diffuse or intestinal. And now we want to layer some information on top of that. So on top of the pictures, we want to layer some information about the actual function of the cells. You know, What's making your cancer cell tick? What are the changes that make it grow, take the brakes off, prevent it from uh, slowing down when it's supposed to? And what we've learned from looking at uh, large numbers of stomach cancer patients' samples uh, specifically, this is data from the TCGA, uh, which is a big cooperative group 
um, that focuses on looking at changes in proteins and DNA in cancers is that stomach cancers that look similar under the microscope are actually uh, somewhat different, and they, based on the genetic features, they can be divided into four groups. And there's an Asian cancer research group that has sort of come to a similar conclusions, although with some slight differences. And so what you see here is these four groups, they share patterns. It's a lot about pattern recognition. Uh, you see patterns of DNA changes in different groups, and we can use that information to help think about uh, different options for treatment. Uh, it's something that we get asked a lot about and is an exciting area of research is, you know, cancer cells, like normal cells, uh, they grow and die and they have some additional mechanisms to uh, let tumor cells and tumor components out into the blood. So this picture is just showing a tumor which has a blood supply. Uh, that's how it gets oxygen and nutrients. Uh, and when those cells die, some of their tumor DNA gets into the blood. And you can actually detect that DNA in the blood and you can look for tumor-specific DNA changes in the blood. And we're still learning how to use this technology, and there's a lot of you know, research studies and interest, uh, because it's possible that you could follow someone's cancer during their treatment from the blood. And so uh, what I'm showing here in this uh, nice, could be a piece of art, is uh, from Dr. Catanacci, who has spoken at uh, some of these Debbie's Dream symposiums as well. And essentially, each color here is following a different mutation during a patient's treatment. And you can see that this patient got both immunotherapy, a targeted therapy, as well as chemotherapy. And you can see that the portions of mutations change during time. And sometimes we can use that information uh, to select the next therapy. So if you, if you take a step back and you look at this more globally, I, I know this is a pretty busy slide, so um, a lot of these genetic databases are public uh, to people who are involved in the research. And so this is just a snapshot. Um, I selected about 20 genes from the TCGA. And you can't see the individual bars, but each little, each little gray bar is an individual patient sample. And so you might say that the chance of a specific mutation, so uh, ERBB2 or FGFR or PMS2, the individual chance of that mutation is relatively rare, but if you're looking across several hundred genes, the chances of your cancer having a mutation in one of those is relatively high. So as we get better and better about developing drugs to target these mutations, we hope to have more and more opportunities to offer patients uh, therapies based on the genetic changes in their specific tumor. And here I've just highlighted a few drugs. And these are a couple examples uh, from cases that I have been lucky enough to be involved in uh, that we described. So essentially, there's actually levels within DNA changes. So patients who have very, very high levels of copy number for specific genes, they may be the most sensitive. We're still trying to learn this, but uh, here, here are two patients who had very high levels of a gene called HER2 uh, who presented with advanced disease, one patient with a lot of ascites, the other patient with a lot of liver metastases. Uh, and these patients, they got chemo initially, but now they've been on biologic therapies, in this case Herceptin, uh, one case over two years and the other case well over a year. So these are patients who uh, benefited from some understanding of what changes were in their DNA. And HER2 is well described, but we're also dividing this into really small pieces of the pie. Uh, so for example, the lower panel is a gene called MET. Um, it's another receptor. And it's amplified in only about 2 to 5% of patients with upper stomach and lower esophagus cancers. So it's not part of the things we look for if you stop at just the biopsy sample. But if you look in the DNA, you'll find this once in a while. And so this is a patient who got a pill, in this case, crizotinib, um, who benefited well over a year based on some information we learned about their tumor biology. And so, you know, everyone has these random cases, but we want to add up all these cases so we start to see trends to see if the targeted therapy is really benefiting people on average. And the best example of this so far in stomach cancer uh, is something called the TOGA trial. Uh, so this is a study where they looked at people with uh, largely gastric cancers who had overexpression of a protein or amplification of a gene um, called HER2, the same one I just showed you. 
And then they ask the question, uh, does adding this targeted therapy to standard chemotherapy improve uh, the outcomes, in this case, survival? And certainly here you can see that although the numbers are not fantastic, you know, echoing what Joe said, so, you know, you're really only talking about a two and a half month, three month survival improvement. Uh, in the world of stomach cancer, that's considered a statistically significant improvement. So here are people who, because we looked at some of the genetic changes in the tumor, we were able to use that information and we showed uh, that combining targeted therapy or biologic therapy based on that knowledge improved the outcomes. And, and this is certainly the model that we're all striving to get to uh, by understanding more about the gastric cancer uh, biologies through understanding the DNA. But it's a lot more complicated than that. So as you see, the response rates for adding Herceptin, it's not like it's 100%. So why is that? So here's two patients. They both have amplification of a gene, so too many copies, which we would consider that to be a target. They look the same under the microscope, and the genetoscope is a totally made up word, but uh, basically, when you look at more than one gene, you see that these tumors are not actually the same at all. And that may partly explain why one person who has a target responds very well, while another person who has a target doesn't respond very well at all. And so the message here is basically, as we get better at looking and finding more and more genes and alterations, it's actually not just one change, it's the whole environment, the whole context. So it's a, it's a pattern of changes. These are patterns that sort of emerge during treatment uh, with targeted therapy. So one thing we've learned is that uh, when you have a target and you target that specific change, uh, they, they may, uh, the biology of the tumor may change a little bit, meaning the patterns of uh, relapse and progression are a little bit different. So this is just a graphical way to show that there's three patients who all started with the same problem. Uh, they all got targeted treatment and they all did very well. And you see that over time, one of the patients, their tumor came back in multiple locations. One of the patients, it only came back in one location. And the third patient, it came back in the brain only. And this is something that we're, we're observing, but we're still trying to understand why this happens. Uh, and it probably has a relation to the changes in the DNA of the tumor over time, and we'll talk about um, how we're starting to think about assessing that. So the current paradigm is really shown in the top up here. This is sort of how I'm envisioning it. The uh, top arrow is patient gets diagnosed with advanced disease, and, and we're talking about advanced disease mostly here. They are tested for HER2, that's a standard, it's included in the guidelines and then they are given a first-line chemotherapy. That's the first chemo you get. Uh, unfortunately, it does tend to stop working ultimately. Uh, and then usually the, how you choose what to do next is currently based really on, on clinical trials, but not actually on a lot of biologic information. So going forward, uh, we're trying to think about this in a more rational manner. And so same process in the beginning, but we're thinking about looking at more and more genes Hopefully that will give us a better idea of what's the best therapy to start with. And the, the size of the green bar here is intentionally larger because we're hoping with a little bit of biologic information, patients will do better. And then when the, ultimately it doesn't work, we need to understand why. And so undergoing a repeat biopsy, considering a blood draw to look for genetic changes, and some additional technologies, hopefully we can use that information to then select the second choice and then you repeat the process again, select the third choice, and hopefully when you do this iterative process, the, the, you know, the sum, the length of people's survival is improved. That's the model that sort of all of us here, I think, are striving for. So how do you get uh, from here to there? This is sort of coming to the end. Um, better subtyping, so going beyond just looking under the microscope but starting to look at the tumor DNA, understanding these different patterns of these different subtypes. Uh, even within a molecular target, there's a lot of differences. Um, so this is a slide from a friend and a, a colleague at uh, Samsung Medical Center in Seoul. Basically what she was showing is that all of these patients tested positive for the target HER2, so they would all be given Herceptin. 
However, they're actually very different. And so all of these other blocks here, all of these other different colors are telling you the other changes beyond just the single target that were present in there. So again, it's really, it's really the environment that the DNA lives in uh, that is sort of guiding and helping us explain why some people do well and some people may not do as well. And then I know that Dr. Hecht and others um, will be talking a little bit about immunotherapy, but we're learning more and more about the intersection of DNA changes and immunotherapy. So people who have a lot of DNA changes, certain specific DNA changes, uh, may be more sensitive or more responsive uh, to immunotherapy. And ultimately, to confirm all of these things that I'm talking about, you really need to do clinical trials because we have to test these ideas. It's, it's not just that we should do this on one-off patients. You know, we need to do this in somewhat of an organized manner. So I'll skip this one. It's a little repetitive. So I'm going to end with uh, some, some thoughts for everybody as well. Uh, and that is just keep asking questions. Uh, all of the patients, the caregivers, I know uh, some of the spouses, uh, note taking I think is a great idea. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not seen at one of the more academic institutions, you know, ask your doctor what they think about clinical trials. Maybe that's just something you didn't ask so it never came up. Uh, connect with other people like through Debbie's Dream and some of these other organizations. Share your story. Those are here or obviously um, already got that message. And then think about what you can do for research. You know, can you uh, participate in some way? Maybe it's just donating a tumor sample, a blood sample, or maybe it's actually participating in a clinical trial. So I'll end there and thank you.